Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word that nourishes us, that sustains and empowers us, and that gives us life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, homecomings are generally happy events. Reunions with family and friends, a chance to walk around the old neighborhood and remember and reflect. Homecomings give us a chance uh, to remember all the people and all the places that have shaped us. And they give the hometown folks a chance to catch up with us, see how we've turned out and what's been going on with us. When hometown heroes come home, there's usually parades and speeches. War heroes and sports heroes get the red carpet. We knew she'd be someone special one day, they say. And then everyone takes credit. I taught him how to shoot free throws when he was just this high. So Jesus came to his hometown Nazareth with, with his disciples. And Jesus had been really busy. He'd been healing sick people, he'd been casting out demons, he had raised the dead, he was preaching the reign of God, and he was teaching people. His power over demons and disease and death were well known throughout all of Israel. And word spread quickly through his hometown. Did you hear what Jesus did? He quieted the storm with just a couple words. Well, I heard that he drove out a whole legion of demons into a herd of, uh, a herd of pigs, and the pigs went running off the hill and died into the sea. Well, I heard that he healed a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years. Well, I heard he also cured and brought back a little girl from uh, dead to life. Well, now Jesus is back in Nazareth. Back where he grew up in the household of Joseph, back in his home congregation on the Sabbath. And naturally, a son of the congregation was invited to preach. I mean, that was the custom in the synagogue, uh, much like uh, congregations now invite back a seminarian or uh, someone who is a pastor to, when they come to their home church. Or kind of like um, happened here uh, went for the 75th anniversary when Adam Adson came back and was a speaker. Now, we don't know what Jesus preached on on that Sabbath. Probably it was from the assigned text from Moses and the prophets. And if it was like the other time that he preached in the synagogue that I uh, read with Madeline, it was probably about how he was fulfilling Moses and the prophets, or how the reign of God had broken in with his coming, or how his appearance signaled uh, the moment of the world's salvation. But the congregation obviously paid little attention to his sermon. And questions filled their minds and distracted their thoughts as they listened. Where did he get all this? This, this wisdom, these miracles, where did it all come from? Isn't this the carpenter? I mean, we used to hang out at his, at his shop on the hill before he went off to Judea to become a, a rabbi. He even built a table and chairs for us. Uh, and, and when the one leg in the table wasn't right, we took it back and he fixed it for us. This is Mary's boy. He grew up here. He played with our kids, played games right over there in the street. He went to the synagogue with our boys. We know his family. We know his younger brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And his sisters are with us. How can he say and do these things? And the more questions they asked, the more offended they got. And Mark tells us, and Jesus couldn't do any deed of power there because of their unbelief, except that he healed a few sick people. Failure. Have you ever failed at something? Maybe school, life, job, family? Maybe you failed a course in school many years back. 
Or maybe there was an assignment at work that you just blew. Or maybe you failed at a marriage. Or maybe you failed with children, not enough time with them, or you handled the situation badly. Or maybe you've failed to live up to your own expectations. The Gospel and the other two readings today are challenging readings. And in some ways, I don't care for them uh, because they talk about failure and weakness. They hit a little bit uh, too close to home. Jesus and his disciples' ministry brings rejection, anger, criticism, hostility, and failure. In the first reading that you heard, which was the call of Ezekiel to be a prophet, Ezekiel is told that people will refuse to hear failure. And in the reading from 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecution, and a thorn in the flesh. Failure. I don't like failure in in myself or in others. And I don't really care to admit when I'm wrong about something or when I failed about something. But failure is a reality of life. Uh, My father-in-law, with his dry sense of humor, always used to say, why do you think they put erasers on pencils? Over the years, I've had relationships that fail. I've had music performances that have failed. I've had sermons that have bombed. I've made some very expensive firewood in my woodworking shop. And in some ways, I'm a pastor because I failed. But there is an interesting word of comfort here. After Jesus' failure in his hometown, he sends his disciples out in ministry with instructions as to what to bring and what not to take and what to do in the face of failure and rejection. You know, shake the dust off their feet. And the disciples come back and were told that they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Success. I kind of struggled this week with these texts. Um, They were hard because, as I said, I don't like failure. And it was hard for me to hear God's word for me, for you, and for the congregation. And then I realized that there is this thread uh, connecting all of the readings. A rejection, uh, failure, and weakness of God's people, or the people that God calls into ministry. Yet, despite that rejection and failure and weakness, God still calls and equips his followers for ministry and accomplishes God's purposes through us. God's word for us is that death and failure bring resurrection. Jesus' failure, his death on the cross, brought life. And just as God was at work in Jesus to bring life out of death, so God is at work to bring life out of death in our lives. Jesus is at work in our lives, taking our failures and bringing good and new and life and possibility. You see, failure is this wonderful moment of learning. It's one of our most teachable times, and it's the moment when life begins anew. And I think that is maybe what, it mean, what Jesus means when he says to Paul in that second reading, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. It was the end of my uh, junior year in college, and for my degree in violin, I had to perform two recitals, a junior recital and and a senior recital. And before we could perform our recital, we had to do it for the faculty. Well, for lots of reasons, when I played my junior recital for the faculty, 
it was a complete and utter failure. I remember trying to get a hold of my teacher the day before saying, I can't do it, we have to postpone it, but he wasn't available, and he never showed up for his lessons that morning. So the first time I saw him was when I was on stage ready to start. And it started off bad, and it got worse, and it was probably the, most, the longest and most humiliating hour of my life. But out of that failure, two wonderful things happened. First, I took a, a long, realistic look at my violin playing and my practice methods and where I was headed. And the result was that the next year, I gave two excellent uh, solo recitals. I was a far better violin player, and I received some really valuable insights into myself. But more than that, that failure provided the impetus for me to seriously consider God's call to be a pastor that I had been ignoring and pushing aside for a long time. So, how is God at work in your lives to transform your failures into good? How's Jesus at work in your life to show his power in your weakness? How is Jesus at work in your life calling you to serve despite your failures and your weakness?